Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship gathering. It is good to uh, be together, even though we're at a distance. We believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. We believe that God is the giver of all good gifts. We believe it is God's rich mercy and grace that saves us, that transforms us, that changes us. And we're going to talk about that today. I'm excited about the, the message I get to share today because uh, it's, it's good news from Ephesians 2. Um, it's also some bad news in there too, but we'll, we'll get to all of that. Wherever you are, whatever is going on in your life, welcome. Pray that God's Holy Spirit would reach you today, that he would meet you where you are and draw, him, draw you closer to a relationship with him. I'm going to open with uh, Psalm 95 and then we'll, we'll worship through singing and then there'll be a message in a bit. But hear these good words about this good God. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The mountain peak belongs to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry ground. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Welcome again. I invite you to join us in a time of worship through song now. Thy 
faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faith These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. Let's worship the Lord. Because he lives. Oh, Lord. 
We are in a series of messages studying the letter to the Ephesians. We're doing this to help us as a church follow and live in the way of Jesus. We've been saying each week that everything we do shapes and reshapes our reality. We've talked about the Tetris effect. The Tetris effect is when you play Tetris over and over again, your brain and body gets rewired to get better at Tetris. Your brain actually starts dreaming about Tetris and it, uh, your brain makes new neural pathways to help you get better at Tetris even when you aren't playing. This Tetris effect happens not just with video games, but with all of the things we give time and energy. Our heart, our head and hands come together to form habits and patterns. Everything we do, especially the things we do repetitively, are reshaping and rewiring us. Sometimes that is really, really good, right? You get gifted at a job or a hobby. It's a blessing to see people use uh, remarkable, well-trained gifts for the glory of God. We see musicians whose hands have been crafted over time to make beautiful music. I mentioned figure skaters last week and, and builders. People are able to do things well over years and years of shaping practice. I used to watch my grandmother knit. It was unbelievable. She had learned over time. She could crank out hats, gloves, afghans. Do you all know what an afghan is? Do you remember those? The afghan is this blanket you drape over your couch. Now you go to Target and get a blanket to put on your couch. But before Target, we had grandmothers who used to knit us things. Uh, so in the 80s, everyone had a plaid couch. And when you got this plaid couch, a grandmother would then knit you a plaid afghan that did not match at all, but that was given to put on that said couch. Now, neither the couch or the blanket were comfortable, but it was made with love, well-crafted, and you loved it. And it was made by someone with skill, worked over time. Anyway, uh, this Tetris effect can be really good, like for knitting or for building and for making gifts to give to others. But for almost all of us, it's also really bad. Uh, Dostoy Dostoevsky said that the second half of our lives is nothing but all of the habits we acquired in the first half. And most of us have developed a lot of bad habits, patterns, addictions. And this goes for us uh, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And some of them are our, our fault, right? Uh, we made decisions, we made choices, we've gotten in ruts, and, and we've uh, set those things up that we have bad patterns that are hard to break. Some of these things happen to us that are outside forces coming at us as we live with trauma and wounds and scars, right? Many people have had traumatic experiences that uh, they then live out over and over again in, our, in their brain, right? Uh, Paul, the author of Ephesians, sees most people following things that are not good for them. And we're going to get into all of those things too, uh, that we, he kind of sees that there are these things in the world that we follow that just drag us down. And Paul calls people to say, no, we have to break away from that and follow Jesus instead. You know, we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. This is the bold claim Jesus makes about himself. He says, I am the way to life. And then he teaches his followers how to live this new life. And he offers the world a new way to live. He invites all who are willing to develop new habits, new practices, new ways to shape us heart, mind, and body into new creation people made for the kingdom of God. That sounds great and hard, right? But we can break free from the bad stuff, the bad patterns, and move towards Jesus and his life. Jesus believes, and the, the Christian church confesses that we are image bearers, made for communion, relationship with God. And we're to have renewed minds and transformed bodies that have a oneness with Christ and one another. And that statement is not a wish for the future. The early church didn't think one day that'll happen. They thought, no, no, Christ means this. He intends us to be like him and to be in a deep relationship with him. 
And that doesn't happen automatically. It's a life that has to be cultivated. It's a life of discipleship. It's a life of practice following in the ways of Jesus. Many of us as self-proclaimed Christians do not have this life. And, I, and it's because our hearts, head, hands are shaped to go to other things. But in Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we believe that in this life, even in the here and now, we can practice the ways of Jesus and move closer to him. Ephesians, this letter that we're studying, is written to help Christian communities come alive and live the way of Jesus. It's written to help form and shape people to find real life in him. And we are taking it as our guide. Each week we are reading a short section we're doing our best to explain it, and then we take some time to reflect on it. Uh, the reflection, the homework, is all of us applying it to our head, heart, and hands. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to dive into the next chunk. And today's chunk is a matter of life and death. Paul believes that we are to move from death to life. So he's talking about life and death matters in this section. Do you ever feel like you're not quite fully alive, that there is this distance between who we are and who we think we should be. And we think, wow, this is just not the way it's supposed to be. Paul believes that all people are dead and they need to be brought to life. This is a challenging teaching he's gonna have and we'll walk through it, but if you wanna be fully alive, listen to what Paul has to say. It's a hard word from Paul because he wants to show us how dead we really are, but it's a good word too if we listen. So uh, there's actually four words we're gonna focus in on, two this week and two next week, but the four words are dead, alive, with, walk. Dead, alive, with, walk. Uh, today we're gonna talk about dead and alive. Next week we'll get into with, walk, but dead, alive, with, walk. Before we dive in, just an another quick word. Give yourself to this teaching today. Wherever you are in faith, Know that this is a letter written that has inspired literally billions of people over 2,000 years on six continents in hundreds of different cultures. People have read these words and been changed. Paul is a greater teacher than Plato or Aristotle or Socrates. Every day, millions of people get up and meditate on these letters, this letter and other letters from Paul. So in this hour, give your head and heart and body to, to listening, to hearing, to discerning. This is one simple way to practice the way of Jesus, to commit yourself to this regular time when we gather as a community, to worship him together and to give ourselves to actively listening to some teaching from the scriptures. Before we dive in, I'm just gonna pray real quick that we would uh, be attentive to this. Lord, Holy Spirit, renew our minds, illuminate our hearts, shape our bodies to be able to listen and hear from you in this hour. Amen. Okay, so Paul opens the letter sharing all the spiritual blessings that Jesus people have in Christ. We've been made holy and blameless before him in love. There is an adoption, there is an inheritance, there is redemption from sin, and all of this is God's plan and for God's glory. And then Paul shares how he's praying for the Jesus people. He prays for them to have the Spirit he prays for their hearts to be illuminated with wisdom and revelation. He prays for them to see the hope they have, the inheritance they have, and this great power. And that's what we covered the last couple of weeks, and you can go back and listen to those if you missed them. But now he continues in chapter two by reminding the Ephesians and Christians where they were apart from God. All right, so we're gonna, little, little pieces at a time. This is a verse two, uh, chapter two, verse one. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived. Uh, the Greek word for live here is peripateo. You can say it with me, peripateo. It means walking or the way you walk. Now, I bring this up because it, it's important because Paul uses this word a ton in Ephesians. He's challenging, he's calling readers to see themselves as people who are following or walking in the steps of a master or teacher. And he's challenging them to consider this question, which way are you walking? Who are you following? These are the questions he wants the church to wrestle with. He wants to see that there's lots of things calling us to walk with them, to follow them. And, and he wants to keep pressing the church to walk in the ways of Jesus. 
So in this he's saying, you used to walk in this dead way of sin. And to walk in sin is death. Paul says to the Romans, the wages of sin and death is death. So if you go to work for sin every day, the pay is death. The money you make from all of your sinful ways and habits is death. That's our wages. And he continues, following the course of this world, this deadness comes from following something else other than God. And Paul believes they were following three things. Humans apart from God are following three things. First, they follow the course of this world. And what that means is humans follow the natural patterns, cares, concerns, and solutions of this world. Uh, this could refer to lots of things. The various religions of the world, the ideologies, the philosophies, the political systems, the values, the economic systems. It could also mean some of the more mundane stuff, you know, um, the influences of peer pressure, fashion, the media, um, advertisers, all the, the products of our society. This is all the stuff that we end up following and caring about in this world. It could be other religions, philosophies, could be money, sex, power, could be fashion, popularity. It's all the stuff you go to to find life and happiness. These influences kind of provide a script for living day to day. They, they show you a pattern, a way to live apart from God and his values. They say, care about these things. Walk in this way. These are the ways of our world. Follow them. I, I think a great parable that gets at this is uh, the story of one fish who swims up to another fish and says, hey, how's the water? The fish says, fine. And then the other fish swims off and he says, hey, wait, what is water? So the ways of the world is this water we're swimming in. But you don't really realize it. Of course you want to be famous. Of course you need the latest technology. Of course the goal should be the most money or the biggest house or staying young as long as possible or being as beautiful as possible. Of course this political system is the answer. Of course this way is the solution. We kind of just go along with the priorities of the world around us. And Paul says this leads to death. The course of the world, following the course of the world leads to death. He continues, the next one, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work among those who are disobedient. All right. The second thing is following the ruler of the power of the air. All right, what is, what is that? That's a weird phrase. So there's a lot of different language for this in the New Testament um, letters, but essentially uh, the New Testament authors believe that there is a heavenly spiritual being that we would call Satan or the devil. Jesus calls this being the ruler of this world in the Gospel of John. This entity is called the ruler of the demons in other Gospels or called Satan in other Gospels. In Corinthians, in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul talks about the rulers of this age, meaning Satan and some other spiritual forces. Um, and he mentions other angelic princes who co-rule with Satan over the earth. Um, in the book of the prophet Daniel, this is a wild chapter, chapter 10, we get this glimpse into what is going on with angelic beings. Daniel is in this deep season of prayer. He's been praying for like three weeks. And a, a good angel, <laughs> a good angelic being comes up to him after 21 days and the being says, I've heard your prayers and I'm coming to help you, Daniel. But I've been fighting the prince of Persia for 21 days. And then the angel says, then I got help from one of the chief princes, Michael, another angel. And then later in the chapter, this same being says, okay, I have to go fight the Prince of Persia with Michael. And then after that, we got to go deal with the Prince of Greece. They didn't mean physical humans. They meant these other angelic beings that are in opposition to God. There appears to be this understanding uh, from people like Daniel and people like Paul that there is this fallen angel, Satan, who is trying to rule the world and fighting the ways of Christ. In the Corinthian letter, they are the ones who work to put Christ to death and they're using earthly rulers and nations to do their bidding. Persia and Greece and Rome uh, have these ruling spiritual beings trying to possess and get those nations to do their bidding. Uh, we see this kind of reality when Satan tempts Jesus. He shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and offers them to Jesus if he will bow down and worship him. Uh, we don't hear that he's lying. Uh, it appears he had some power or possession of the world at that time and that he was offering to Jesus. And we believe these powers are broken in the resurrection of Christ. 
Christ is Lord, he's vindicated, he's set right, he's proven the righteousness of God, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and now he is Lord who will come to judge the living and the dead. He defeats Satan and reclaims the world. But now these princes and rulers of the air, they seem to still be out there somewhere living in rebellion against the breaking in of God's kingdom, won by Christ. And they're trying to pull other people to join them in this rebellion, and lots of us in the world go and follow after them. Now, just a word about this last phrase. He says, among those who are disobedient. We do not like this language. We do not like the language of disobedient, but it's fairly consistent in the New Testament. Paul sees all humanity that does not follow Jesus as disobedient. Uh, in John 16, Jesus claims that the great sin of this world is unbelief. Romans 1 shares that though people had a knowledge of God, they chose not to acknowledge him and were handed over to the flesh and senses. There is this rejecting of God. Humans are disobedient. And the more we go into the way of disobedience, the more there appears also to be this satanic, demonic power gaining influence. In other places, we see Paul saying things like, as people live in disobedience, they're handed over or their senses are darkened. This makes sense. You become more like the ones you follow. And those things that you follow have a compound effect shaping you over time, right? The Tetris effect occurs and your brain and heart and body can become wired into sin and into following these bad ways, this world, this, this, these satanic forces. You walk with Christ and you become more Christ-like. You follow the ruler of the air and you become more caught up in evil. Now, don't get all proud this is not a moment where you think about how you know why your friend's life is such a mess, right? Some of us are saying that right now, like, oh, that's why this person's following the wrong thing. No. no, listen to the next line. Verse three, all of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh. Do not get all proud. Do not diagnose someone else here. Don't say, oh, that disobedient world. Paul is writing to Christians and reminding them to self-reflect and lament their former ways. Remember your old ways. Why would you want to live in sin any longer? We are to always be taking the plank out of our own eye. Now listen, if you disobey the way of Christ because you follow the way of the world and culture around you, that makes sense, right? Someone doesn't believe in Jesus, they follow someone else. If you disobey the way of Christ and don't follow him because of a, a spiritual force has captured your heart and mind, that kind of makes sense, right? And anyone in those places, we should be praying for and wrestling with God on their behalf as they are captive and caught up in the ways of death. So there's no boasting, no arrogance. But if, if you have the Holy Spirit, if you say, yes, I'm a Christian, I believe, I follow, and you're disobeying the way of Jesus, that's what doesn't make sense, right? If you, if we have tasted the grace of God and still insist on disobeying, that is what doesn't line up. That's what doesn't make sense. We, the Christians, the ones claiming the power of the Holy Spirit, we, the Christians who claim to submit to the Lordship of Jesus, when we still follow the course of the world or follow the ways of the spirit of the air, it is we who do not make sense. This is a self-reflection word to us. Are we the hypocrites? Where are we the hypocrites? Remember those ways and don't go into them anymore. Instead, go in the way of Christ. Now, Paul gives one more way we once lived here. He says, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. So it is the world, the devil, and the flesh that we followed, making us children of wrath. There is a lot we could say here about what makes up a person, um, but that would get long and complicated. Maybe we can dig deeper into that in a future message, but I'm, I'm gonna try to say a few words. Paul sees this flesh and senses, or these desires, as part of our humanity. And this flesh or desire appears to have more influence and control of our lives than they should. We end up following them, right? And we shouldn't be following them, we should be controlling them. So, um, I think in each human there are these base human desires, right? Um, they're called first order desires. We want to survive, we want safety, security, um, we want uh, connection, relationships, uh, sexual desires. We want to fit in. We want to be powerful, right? Now, these desires aren't necessarily bad, and they can be good. 
but they can become really bad when they take control over our lives. Right? Wanting to have safety is not bad. Having to go to war, destroy every other nation or every other person to make sure you have all the safety you need all the time, that's bad. Wanting community and relationships and to fit in, that, that's good. We're wired for community. We're wired to live by, we can't live alone, right? Pretending to be someone you aren't, lying about yourself to get others to like you is not good, right? You're trying to get that first need met and you end up doing a lot of bad stuff. And that desire for one thing can lead you to a lot of bad things. That doesn't make you more human, but less. So we have these desires, right? But humans also appear to have this kind of second order desires, or we have the power to reflect and consider what, what we can do. Like we can go against those. We can control those desires. We can sacrifice to do things that maybe aren't in our best interest. We can say this is wrong to ourselves and say, I'm not gonna do this. We can say, I'd rather sacrifice myself than hurt someone else. Um, and then there's the ability of humans to make a choice for the good. We're moral beings with something inside us wrestling, right? We have the ability to rightly order our flesh and desires, and we're actually held accountable by God to do so. We can't say, I'm not sorry, it's just human nature. That's definitely a way of this world, right? The way of our modern world is dominated by our flesh instincts. Our advertisers and social media feed on these first desires. But to let these desires control our whole, whole being is, is, uh, is to live in slavery in, in the thinking of Jesus and Paul and the early Christians. Uh, Leo Tolstoy, another Russian uh, novelist, has a quote. He says this, all men of the modern world exist in a continual um, antagonism, flagrant antagonism between their conscience and their way of life, right? So we're living this one way, getting drawn in by these desires and our conscience saying, no, we're, we're, we're wrestling. The way of Jesus and the way of Paul see following the flesh and sense as slavery. You should be controlling them where they follow you, these desires, instead of being led around by them. True freedom in the Christian conception would be to live beyond that, to reach a higher plane where your desires and flesh do not rule you, but in Christ's way you live for something more, something more fully human. That's a heavy concept, and I wanna flesh this out a bit more, pun intended, but time is not permitting. Uh, one more word on that real quick. Uh, for Paul, he sees this war between the flesh and life and the spirit. And Paul believes that the new covenant, new creation, gift of the spirit, which is God's empowering presence, is what helps us to overcome this slavery to flesh and leads to true freedom and humanity. We have the scriptures, we have the spirit, and we can seek the scriptures and we can plead for the power and presence of the work of the Spirit to eliminate our hearts and to shape us. We have the words of Jesus. We have the teachings of Paul in the early church and we have the power of the Spirit. We can move forward. We can learn. We can grow. We can be in control of these desires in Christ. So those are the three. The consequences of walking or following these ways is the wrath of God. The wrath of God is coming upon the disobedient and it is death. Depressing, difficult, scary, right? Here are the next few verses. Here are verses four to nine. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the results of work so that no one may boast. It's a good word here. We were dead. And there's all this powerful, dangerous, scary stuff that possesses us, Satan, the world, our own flesh is trying to take over and it wants to keep us dead. But God's rich mercy and great love saves us from death and makes us alive with Christ. It is by grace you are saved. His grace and his mercy and his love is bigger, more powerful than all the evil forces seeking to keep us dead. His grace is stronger 
than death. It makes the dead alive. The final word is not death. The final word is life. You will find what it means to be fully alive only by the grace of God. There is this deadness, but there is mercy. There is this deadness, but there is great love. There is this deadness, but there is the gift of grace from God. That leads to the overcoming of death and the breaking in of life. We are not slaves to sin. We need not follow the world, the flesh, or the devil. We are not destined to be the results of all our bad habits. Why? This is foundational and why I said last week that we must sit with Jesus because we must be reminded of this. The why is first and foremost because of the grace of God. Is a death to life decision made by us? Is it made by me? We might, might look like it at times and we do make decisions and choose to believe in all of that, but is death to life decision first made by us? No, it's made by God. Can we raise ourselves up? No, God raises us up. Can we sit ourselves with Jesus? Can we save ourselves through our own efforts? No. When we were dead, God made us alive by grace. All of this is grace. By grace, you've been saved. Paul says it twice. He has to say it twice. It is by grace you are saved. It is the gift of God, not of works. No one can boast. God, through grace, saves the Christian from death. He makes the Christian alive. And it is fully alive to be who we are to be. It is not just some future hope that's part of it. That is part of it. But it's also a past decision by God and to be lived as a present reality. In Ephesians 1.4, it says, when he's doing all these blessings, just as he chose us before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. God is holy and God is love. This disobedience of ours is a rejection of his love and makes us enemies against the holy God. But the grace of God makes us holy to be in the presence of the holiness of God. That's the blessing Paul is going on and on about. He's saying, look at this Ephesians, look at this Christians. You're holy and blameless in the love of God. You're not children of wrath. We're adopted children, holy and blameless before him in love. Live into that. Make that the reality because that's what you're destined for. It's good. What do we do with all this? What must we do with our body, with our head and with our heart and our hands and body here? I said last week that when I, I sit with my children in quiet space, that is when they are fully alive. It's when they are um, in that love of their parents. It's in those moments when they're holy and blameless. It's in those moments, the beginning of the day, the end of the night, when we're uh, putting them to bed. They are secure as our children and living in the grace of our home and the love that's freely given to them from parents. It's in those spaces that they come alive, they grow, they learn. They come alive when they're living in that mercy and love and grace of their parents' home. It's in those moments that they feel homely, holy and blameless to us. Not throughout the whole day, but in those moments. <laughs> that's what we're kind of made for to be with, with God. We're made to be holy and blameless before him, sitting in the richness of his mercy, his love and grace. So for the body, again, the word is sit this week. Next week, it'll be walk, but this week, sit again. We're to be seated with Jesus. Envision yourself seated with Christ. Envision yourself in God's grace and holy and blameless before him and that you have access to him. So sit with him this week. Talk to him. Share with him. Be honest and open with him about what's going on in your heart and in your head. Here are a few things to wrestle with in your head and heart as you sit. And I encourage you to do this this week. Be honest. Set aside time just to sit with God and wrestle with what's going on in your heart and head. So head. There's an absolute deadness apart from the grace of God and being with Christ. There's an absolute deadness. In that void, you'll follow some combination of three other things, the world, the flesh, or the devil. There is not some neutral space. You will walk this way or that way. You will follow something. As Bob Dylan says, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve. 
somebody? Is your mind willing to accept? Is your mind willing to accept that you're either following Christ or following deadness? Is your mind willing to accept that you are following something and that is going to be Jesus or the broad path of the world and your flesh or the devil? Can your mind accept that? Or is there a pride within us that thinks we don't need to follow anyone or there's a different way or there's multiple paths? Maybe we don't need to serve anyone. We're Americans or we are free or we are, you know, we've achieved things. If you're wrestling, maybe that's the course of this world grabbing your mind. Is your mind willing to accept these things? Is your heart willing to accept that you are following either Christ or deadness? Is your heart illuminated enough to be broken and humble and in need for the grace of God to make you alive? Is your heart open to that? Can your heart notice that things aren't the way they should be? That you get caught up following things that aren't good for you? Can your heart see where it longs or is still possessed by dark ways, the old paths? If not, if you think, no, 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 everything's fine. Maybe you're following the wrong thing. It's telling you you're self-sufficient. Maybe it's the flesh or the prince of the air that might be feeding our heart a lie. That we're plenty alive as it is. Is your heart demanding another way other than the rich mercy and grace of God? Sit with that. Is your mind willing to accept the grace of God? Can you assent to that mentally? That apart from God, we are dead, but that his mercy is rich, his love is abundant, and his grace is a saving gift. Can your mind submit to the greatness of God, the giver? Can your mind accept the grace of God as the ultimate reality of the universe? Can your mind look up and say, this is all grace. This is all gift. Or are you wrestling with that and rejecting that possibility? And what does your mind think is true instead of that? Where did you get those other ideas? Who or what are you following that leads you to, leads your mind to reject the grace of God? Lastly, is your heart willing to accept the grace of God? Can you accept that without God's grace, you're dead and his grace makes you alive? Can your heart admit the greatness of your need? Can your heart receive a gift that you can't pay back? Can your heart hear a tough word from God that, that you are dead from, apart from my gift and you are alive because of my gift? And I call upon your heart to believe and receive it as a gift with no boasting. Does your heart want to contribute to have something to boast and fight the free gift of God? If so, who or what is your heart following that leads your heart to resist the grace of God? Can our hearts and head accept the grace of God? If so, we will walk in his ways. If not, it's because we're following other things and we kill, and we're still can't accept the grace of God. Receive his grace, accept it all as gift. Sit with him this week and wrestle in your heart and head. Who are you following? The ways of the Father, the ways of Christ, the way of the gift of the grace of God given in the power of the Spirit. Or the ways of those old broken paths that lead and keep us in dead places. Let's pray. Lord, show us your abundant mercy and your grace. Show us where our hearts and minds and body run to things that are no good that lead to death. Free us from that slavery. Meet us where we are. I pray for those who are hurting, for those who are struggling, for those who are caught up in bad things. Reveal yourself. Make your grace evident. Show your mercy and love to them. Call them to you. Lord, set us free. Lord, help us keep your words in our hearts and minds this week. Help us go to you in prayer. Help us find ways to sit with you. Help us be more aware of where we're following what is no good. And by the power of your spirit, help us put into practice following you in your ways. It's in your holy, good, and precious name we pray. Amen.
Jesus, Master, whose I am, purchase thine alone to be. By thy blood, O spotless Lamb, shed so willingly for me. Let my heart be all thine own. Let me live for thee alone. Other lords have long held sway. Now thy name alone to bear. Thy dear voice. Alone obey is my daily hourly prayer. Whom have I in heaven but thee? Nothing else my joy can be. Jesus, Master, who Though so feebly and so ill, strengthen hand and heart and nerve, all thy bidding to fulfill. Open up mine eyes to see all the world. Jesus, Master, I am thine. Keep me faithful, keep me near. Let thy presence in me shine. All my homeward way to cheer. Jesus, at thy feet I fall. Oh, be thy my all in all. Oh, be thou my all in all. Before I close with the benediction, I just wanted to say something about giving. Uh, as I'm sure Many of you know, uh, with the pandemic and, and people not attending church as often, and even in the beginning for the first few months where we didn't have church services, uh, given, giving has fallen off quite a bit. And I'm sure that's true for uh, every church. Um, we personally here at First Baptist Church are down over 20, 25%. Uh, we take a look at, you know, we make our budget each year. We take a look at the numbers that came in from the year before, and we use those numbers to try to figure out what, um, you know, what we can spend during the following year. Um, this year being what it is, uh, expenses are the same, uh, but the, uh, the giving is down. Um, quite frankly, giving is a, is a heart issue. Um, pastors... Don't like to talk about giving that much, but it is a, an act of worship. Um, I want to read to you a verse that Paul wrote to the uh, church in Corinth. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. He writes this, Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I took a look at this week at my own giving, and I compared it to last year, and I noticed that I was off a bit. So I've made some adjust adjustments for the rest of the year to, to catch up. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, that may be the case with a lot of people because we haven't been attending church uh, as we once did. So I, I ask if you are um, 
inclined to support our ministry here, if you're, especially if you are a member uh, that is watching this, take a look at last year. And if things are the same for you uh, from a financial standpoint, then I ask that uh, you, know, you check that out and see if, if you are behind a little bit and get caught up. Uh, if you are going through a difficult time, which I know a lot of people are at this time, then of course this doesn't pertain to you. But I would say for those who aren't giving or who haven't given, it is, it is a heart thing. It's a trust thing. So start with something small, you know, five bucks, ten bucks, just to, to get into the rhythm of supporting the ministry. Because God does love a cheerful giver. It it gives him an opportunity to provide for you. If you trust the Lord and you trust his provision for you, then trust that what you give, he will uh, replace. He will take care of you. Uh, he will not leave you wanting. So I ask that you prayerfully consider your giving at this time. And if you're watching and you belong to a, a local church someplace else, then I'll speak on, on behalf of your pastor there that I'm sure the giving at that church is, is down as well. So, so take a look and, and see if there is a way to uh, match what you did the year before or even start giving in some small way. And now for the benediction. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So go, knowing that nothing can separate you from Christ's love for you. Walk in that, believe in that, trust in that. Amen? Amen.